Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, uh, to the uh, UT Science Meets Society seminar series. This is hosted by the Environmental Science Institute. It's the first, uh, I guess, lecture uh, of this series. It's something that uh, Sheila Olmsted and I were having lunch one day, and uh, Sheila's right here. And we were talking about uh, what would be kind of a, a new and kind of interesting way to interact on campus and to bring students and faculty and the general public together on issues that UT was having an impact uh, uh, that were science-based, uh, but uh, basically impacting society and how we could bring that out. And so we thought about uh, this seminar series. And so it's pretty exciting that we've worked together and uh, now uh, have uh, brought our first one out. So um, today we have a, a really uh, special uh, group um, talking about the Wimberley floods. Uh, and uh, even larger central Texas uh, extends beyond that. And one of the motivations behind this uh, was my uh, father and mother-in-law. They live in Wimberley, and they're uh, right there, Pat and Linda McDowell. And uh, their home, uh, not their house house, but their property, which has a bunch of stuff on it, uh, has been flooded several times now. And so I've been down there yeah, three times, three times in the last two years. And I think before that it may have been how many years? Um, it never did flood. Never did flood. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, so there's a lot of things that have been changing um, in terms of the hydrology uh, uh, with respect to both rainfall but also uh, development, how that's impacting it. So that was kind of one of the motivations for uh, uh, bringing out this seminar. So that today we have uh, four special guests. We have Don Ferguson, uh, the city administrator of Wimberley, uh, here to present, first right here. Um, we have David Maidman. Uh, Professor Maidman's the Hussein M. Uh, Alhante Centennial Chair in Civil Engineering, and he's also the former director of the Center for Research and Water Resources here at UT. Uh, Harry Evans. Um, Mr. Evans, the former chief of staff of the Austin Fire Department, and now a senior research fellow with the Center for Research and Water Resources here at UT. And then uh, Cal Streeter down at the end. And Professor Streeter is the Meadows Foundation Centennial Professor in the quality of life in the rural environment, uh, and he is in the School of Social Work. So let's give them all a warm welcome, and we'll get started. Uh, I first would like to say thank you very much. If you can't hear me in the back, please let me know. I've, my wife tells me I have a rather loud voice. My son the same. But uh, my name is Don Ferguson. I'm the city administrator for the city of Wimberley, and I want to first of all thank you all for the opportunity uh, today to come talk about a story that quite frankly is not fun to tell, but I think it's important to tell, that people understand uh, the magnitude of what Mother Nature can do. And, and it's not pretty, and uh, you're going to see some images today that, that are going to be, I think, hopefully amazing to you, but hopefully will be defining to you. So let's talk uh, first of all, let me pull this up here real quick. I'll try to run through quite a few slides, so hang with me now. Uh, we call this presentation Wimberley Strong, and as I said, it is really a, a story about a community that uh, was changed momentarily overnight. And uh, to kind of start things off, I want to set the scene a little bit about what Wimberley is. If, if you've not been there, let me tell you, it's a community of about 2,600 people located in western Hayes County. Uh, it's a community that has a large tourism base. Uh, it's a community that takes about 39 inches of rain a year. It's a community that has a unique brand and the brand of the community is Wimberley, a little bit of heaven. And what I want to talk to you about is a day that will go down in history, and that's Saturday, May the 23rd. And it was a day that this community with a little bit of heaven met a little bit of hell. The day itself was cloudy, humid, threat of heavy rain, and threat of flash flooding on the river. So everybody knew something was out there, something was coming. It was a matter of when, and it was a matter really truly about how bad. Uh, during the day... We had a series of showers and thunder showers that moved through that really only dumped about a couple of inches of rain in Wimberley proper. But the conditions out west and northwest of Wimberley were vastly different in Blanco. Uh, we received word late in the afternoon at 6 o'clock that uh, some 6 to 8 inches of rain had fallen near Blanco. And we later found out that close to 10 to 12 inches of rain had fallen west, southwest of Blanco in a community called Candelia. We don't have any advance warning in Wimberley as far as floods go. Uh, the only river gauge that exists on the Blanco River for Wimberley is in Wimberley, in downtown Wimberley. So it's a matter of guessing. And uh, we guess rather accurately based on kind of an old-timers network that's in place. 
where we have some old folks that live upstream, and they call us when they get a heavy rain. And we know it takes about eight hours for a heavy rain to fall from Blanco down to Wimberley. That's when we normally see the rise. The unknown in the equation is the Little Blanco. And in this situation, we had no clue that the Little Blanco had been hit as hard as it was. This shows you a picture of the rainfall pattern. The six to eight inches of rain, and then you can see the concentrated levels of 9 to 11 and 12 to 13. As I told you, the old timers notified us about 6 o'clock and said, we've gotten a lot of rain. A couple of moments later, we had a call back saying, you need to understand, I've been here 45 years and water is going where it has never gone before in our neighborhood. You need to get ready. Our fire chief at the time, a gentleman by the name of Carol Sekas, longtime fire chief, looked at me, and I'll never forget his words when he said, this may be the day that my resort takes water. He owns the 7A Resort on the Blanco River, which sits quite a ways back off the river. And I can tell you folks in this particular event, he was dead right. His facility did take water, and you'll see the remnants in a moment. So based on these reports from upstream from the Old Timers Network, we decided to go ahead and pull the trigger. We did it about two and a half hours before the water ever came into Wimberley. We blocked off River Road. We started door-to-door -door evacuations in some of the extreme low-lying areas. Uh, we sent out warning calls through a citywide information network we have on the phone. Uh, we also began the process of planning for shelters and those type of things. Protective actions were taken, as I said, close to two hours before the event hit. Low water crossings over the Blanco were gated. As I said, we issued the warnings. And we also began calling on swift water rescue teams from the state as well as from area fire departments just because of what we were hearing and what we were expecting. When it was going to come, who knows? 911 calls began to pour in at that time. The first call we got that opened our eyes was a call from somebody upstream who said that water was going over the Fisher Store Bridge, which is north of Wimberley on the Blanco, northwest of Wimberley on the Blanco. It's a very tall concrete structure that was built several years ago. It's not an old bridge, uh, but it was designed, and it was designed to survive that 100-year flood. We were getting calls that the water was topping that bridge. Later, we found out that the water topped that bridge by close to 17 feet. The rise really started in Wimberley about probably about 9 o'clock. Uh, we saw it in surges. It was almost a tsunami type effect. We saw an initial surge that came in, and then we started seeing large rises in that. The calls obviously started to pick up at the 911 dispatch center. This call from somebody talking about a car they saw floating. This call talking about the fact that water was coming into their house and their elderly parents couldn't get out. This call right here saying they're running out of breathing room. The water was in their house. This particular call was one of the last calls that came out of the vacation house that most people are aware of and they've heard so much about. We had a home that was on stilts uh, that got taken off its stilts and floated down the river about, oh, probably about a half mile before it slammed into the Rancho 12 Bridge. It was an amazing event. In four hours, the Blanco River rose into five feet to nearly 41 feet. At one point, we were seeing jumps in the river level about five feet every 15 minutes. The floodwaters topped the Rancho 12 Bridge in town about four feet. As the Blanco River rose, obviously the backwater problem started developing on the Cypress Creek, Wilson Creek, and some of our other tributaries. When I talk about backwater, they all feed into the Blanco, but if the Blanco is so high, the water in those streams from the rainfall is having to go back the different direction because it can't get into the river itself. As residents and visitors fled to higher ground, the debris-laden floodwaters quickly filled and shattered homes, and as we've talked about before, claimed some 11 lives. This is a video you may have seen, but this was a home in our community taking water that night. The force of water kicking in doors like a SWAT team could never kick in. Shattering windows, taking counters out, it's an amazing scene. As sunrise on Sunday came about, the death and destruction the night before became apparent. That's a look at the river at about 7 o'clock that morning. And I can tell you, this is after the river had close to four hours of going down. So you can imagine how high it was. This is what we saw as we began touring the flood zone. This basically is where that vacation home was located. You can see the stilts. The water did not meet an enemy that it couldn't beat. Best way to put it. Blowing through homes. This home right here, it literally shot straight through, knocked the walls out. Blew out garages, kicked in doors, flipped shelters, literally wrapped roofs around trees, cleaned slabs. I witnessed a three-story home 
out on Flat Acres Road that literally disappeared in about 30 seconds after it got broadsided by a couple of cypress trees. About a million dollar house. Those stories were repeated throughout the night. Blew the roofs off. This is water coming in the building, getting so high with such force that it pops the roof off. Split homes in half. Obviously through cars. The debris load was amazing. This was a mobile home that floated almost two blocks and eventually collapsed. <clears throat> this is the resort, or what's left of the resort of the fire chief. He had 20 cabins, and he lost 15 of those 20 cabins, some of which we have no idea where they are today, others that were literally stacked on top of each other just down the river. You can see it literally knocked the walls out from under the roof. The debris load was enormous. I, I just can't tell you how extreme the debris load was. And it's not just debris from Wimberley. It was debris from everything from Blanco on down that came through this community. From a standpoint of the, the path, I, I can only liken it, if you look at the aerials of this, as to what it looked like as far as a tornado coming through. Flying it looked back about a quarter mile path that literally just serpentined through the community. What you're looking at is an area that was heavily treed at one time with some rather expensive homes spotting that particular area. But you can see, Mother Nature just simply plowed through it all. The floodwaters took more than homes and lives. We uh, just left a meeting about an hour ago on reforestation, and there's an effort that's underway to try to reforest the Blanco River. The Texas Forest Service has estimated that they lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000 large trees and they consider a large tree with a diameter of 12 inches or greater. We lost some 15,000 of those trees. Lord knows how many smaller trees. But the effort's getting underway to reforest to try to bring the area back to what it used to look like, even though it will never get back to that point. The floodwaters literally peeled the bank back, peeled bark off the trees, toppled huge cypress trees. I'm talking about 600-year-old cypress trees. Put trees where you wouldn't think it could put a tree. That tree didn't come out of the bed on the left-hand side of that picture. That tree literally dropped on that bed and sat poised for close to three weeks before we were able to get in and get it out of there. If you look all the way to the right, what was holding it up was the fork in an oak tree, and it was pinned in that. Don't have time to show you the video of that tree coming down, but if you saw the video coming down, you'd understand the heat and the magnitude. The floodwaters took a toll on our roads and bridges. This is the Fisher Store Bridge we speak of. Look at the size of those concrete platforms that just literally were separated. Upstream, this is the 165 bridge in Blanco. It literally snapped it and twisted the rebar. This is the Ranch Road 12 bridge in Wimberley. The water on that bridge was over four feet, that bridge at the peak. We lost low water crossings. We had roadways carved. This is the bank of River Road. And it's almost an eight foot cut in that particular roadway. So what's next for our community? Well, we talked about the fact that we are without warning. One of the things that we got a phone call um, at nine o'clock Sunday morning after this flood from the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority. And we asked them for help. They said, what can we do? We apologize, we're so sorry for what happened. What can we do? And our comment to them was, give us warning. Just give us warning. And, and, and we have had several discussions with that agency, and they have been grateful in, in this post-flood recovery in coming to our need. But we need river gauges. We need information. We had a meeting with the National Weather Service post this flood where they apologized to us because they didn't have. We were getting a flood stage warning on our river saying it was going to crest at 17 feet. And our river crested well over 40 feet. At the time we got that flood warning from the Weather Service saying 17 feet, we were already at 30 plus. So our comment to them was, we've got to have timely data. We've got to have timely forecasts. So we all got in a room, and no one left until we came up with a solution. And the solution is to implement a monitoring network, and we've done that. Uh, we have a multitude of state agencies, LCRA, GBRA, USGS, Weather Service, cities, counties, up and down the basin that have joined forces, and we're going to be putting in four river gauges. We got funding for those last week confirmed 
We're going to put in four river gauges upstream from Wimberley, and we're going to put in 15 rainfall gauges that will give us six-minute rainfall data that will give us 15-minute river reads. The Weather Service said, give us the data, and we can get you the product. So we're giving them the data, and we feel comfortable we'll get the product for them. So we're moving forward with the gauge system. We're obviously in the process of reconstructing. We have issued probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 175 building permits so far. We had over 350 homes that were damaged or destroyed in our community. That's a quarter of our housing inventory. So we're in the rebuild process. We went through the sprint, and we're done with the sprint of the event. We're in the marathon now, and it's about a three to five year recovery, we estimate. So looking back on the event, just some facts. Obviously, 11 lives lost. More than 100 swift water rescues. About 170 people rescued in those operations. 350 homes damaged or destroyed. 15,000 trees lost, an estimate. Property damage will top $30 million, we feel comfortable. A record flood height of 44.9. That is a conservative number. We have some high water marks that are over 52 to 53 feet tall on the Blanco. In the flood itself, the USGS has estimated that 195,000 acre feet of water passed through the city of Wimberley that night. To give you an idea of what we're talking about, it's the amount of water that would have flooded AT&T Stadium 82 times. That's the Cowboys Stadium. To give you a better perspective, it's about half the capacity of Canyon Lake. The amazing story, which we can't get into because of time, was the recovery and the response. But I can tell you that this community has been blessed with the response. And I'd like to thank you if you've been involved in those responses. If you know those who have, Please extend the thanks, but we've had over 6,000 volunteers that have put over 400,000 hours of volunteer time helping us rebuild. We're just getting started, but we will be back, and hopefully so will the Blanco River. So that's my presentation. I hope I didn't go too long, but hopefully it gives you an idea. Well, that was great. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> Don, we really appreciate your contribution and being able to sort of set the problem in context. So <clears throat> I've been hearing for years, Wimberley needs a flood forecasting system. And in fact, I've been contacting Don uh, long before this flood happened about that. So I'm David Mabnett with the University of Texas at Austin, and I've been collaborating with the National Weather Service on helping to develop a new national flood forecasting system for the United States. And <clears throat> just to review, not simply the flooding that happened uh, in May, Here's some information about the flooding that happened over our, our most recent Halloween flood. So this was the rain that happened uh, in the 2015 Halloween, and the big wide area there is 10 inches of rain that happened uh, largely over the Onion Creek watershed, but it had some in Blanco as well. Uh, the Blanco River at Wimberley for this flood was 71,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, it has a drainage area of 355 square miles, and the elevation was 26 and a half feet. And Don just said the in the... May flood, it was 44 feet. So that in Wimberley, this wasn't as large an event as the May flooding was. However, in Onion Creek, which has a smaller drainage area of 321 square miles, the flow uh, over Halloween was 120,000 cubic feet per second, which is nearly as large as the Halloween flood was in 2013. And the elevation of the water was 39.2 feet, and it was 41.2 feet when the flood happened two years ago on Halloween. So the event that happened over this Halloween was almost as large on Onion Creek as the one that happened two years ago. So it's a really enormous uh, impact in South Austin. Uh, so, and you may ask, well, you know, why was this impact so large? Uh, and it was because the rainfall was centred more over Onion Creek and actually over Wimberley itself than what the May flood was, which was upstream of Wimberley, as Don was saying. Uh, <clears throat> this is the same picture of the rainstorm that Don showed uh, earlier of the Memorial Weekend flooding on the Blanco River, and this is the 40-foot wall of water that overwhelmed the gauge at the Blanco River at Wimberley uh, that he was also referring to. So how can we do a better job when dealing with these kind of things? Well, what was happening during the Memorial Day weekend, and indeed last uh, Halloween as well, is that we had rainstorms, rain events, and rain mapping coming from the National Weather Service that was moving across our state. And I think we've all seen these kinds of maps. But the question is, 
how do you get the corresponding flood maps on the ground? So how can we convert rainfall in the sky to runoff and flood mapping on the ground in real time? That's what we're trying to do. The opportunity is that there's a new National Water Centre that's been established on the Tuscaloosa campus of the University of Alabama by the National Weather Service and its federal agency partners, which is the US Geological Survey, FEMA, and the US Army Corps of Engineers. And this facility has a mission to assess hydrology in a new way for the continental United States. And you may say, why Tuscaloosa, Alabama? Well, thank you, Senator Shelby, who's a native of Tuscaloosa. I mean, nobody's making any pretense. Uh, <laughs> Senator wanted a federal presence in his hometown, so now he has. And this rather beautiful Greek-style building here, well, that's kind of the University of Alabama campus. It's, it's Greek-style campus. But then, beautiful building here. Uh, and this is kind of an interesting opportunity because we've never had a National Water Centre before. So it's sort of like a painting. Now we can say there's a clean canvas here. How can we fill that in? So what do we do now? So the weather forecasting, the river forecasting that Don was referring to is done at the National Weather Service River Forecast Centres. And they're in regional, they have regional coverage, as you can see here, with the different colours. Ours is the West Gulf River Forecast Centre. And these supply information to the weather forecast offices and to first response communities um, largely for forecasting for large basins. The Blanca River at Wimbley is one of the forecast points, as is Onion Creek at Highway 183. There are 6,600 of those basins over the country. What's happening is that the National Weather Service is centralising all of this function at the National Water Centre in Alabama. So there'll be National Hurricane Centre in Tuscaloosa, uh, in uh, Miami, National Water Centre for flooding in Tuscaloosa in, in the future. And I participated in the first uh, meeting of the, uh, at the time that this National Water Centre was first opened in May of 2014, and I suggested to the people who were gathered there, which was the management of the National Weather Service, that if this was a project of the National Science Foundation, it would be held to this standard, which would be, how do you do trans something transformative? In other words, how do we move from evolutionary change to transformative change for the nation? So we're not just moving along at 10% at a time, but how can we do something just radically better? And this definition that you see here is what the National Science Foundation uses to define what is transformative uh, research. New ideas, discoveries are tools that radically change our understanding of an important existing scientific or engineering concept. So I proposed what subsequently came to be called the National Flood Interoperability Experiment as a partnership between the academic community and the National, si and National Weather Service to... Uh, essentially build a prototype national flood forecasting system for the nation and engage graduate students in working with that. So 44 graduate students from 19 universities spent seven weeks at the National Water Centre in June and July last year working on this new system uh, which we had prepared for them ahead of time and this is also going to happen this year and next year as well as a broad scale engagement of the academic community with the National Weather Service and the National Water Centre. In doing that, we used a geospatial data set called the NHD Plus version 1 that's taken 20 years to develop. So what's happened is that we have a national elevation data set for surface topography, a hydrography data set for rivers, uh, a land cover data set to describe uh, land cover of the nation, and a watershed boundary data set to describe watershed boundaries in a structured way. Those each took 10 years to develop, and it took 10 more years to integrate them together. And now we've got a network of 2.7 million catchments, very small catchments that extend right across the country. One of these is this location here, uh, Fritz Hughes Park Road. Some of you may remember Deputy Hollis drove down this road in September 2014. Uh, she was at 2 o'clock in the morning and she was washed off that particular low water crossing and she did not survive. And the rain had been raining already two hours there when she got there. If we'd had a good flash flood forecasting system, communications in her car, she could have been warned. Now that, that catchment is in western Travis County, uh, just by Mansfield Dam, um, and it is in the national system. That's one example of something that might have been a tragedy that might have been prevented. One of the things that we were utilising in doing this work is Stampede. Stampede is a supercomputer that we have at the Pickle Research Campus. It has 500,000 processors operating in parallel. That cooling tank is right outside my office there. 60,000 gallons an hour of water goes into Stampede to cool it during a summer afternoon. And one of the innovations that was involved with the National Flood Interoperability Experiment was moving the forecasting into supercomputing environment, which it hadn't been before. At Stampede, what we demonstrated was that we could start with the National Weather Service's high-resolution rapid refresh forecast for precipitation, called the HER, put that into a model for land atmosphere calculation, which is called NOAA-MP. That's in a framework called WERF-HYDRO, which stands for Weather Research Framework for Hydro Hydrology. 
put that, the runoff from that into a model called Rapid, and you can see this for the Mississippi Basin here, but we've now done this for the whole country, and then produce uh, forecasts. You see here probabilistic flood forecasts to look at different ensembles, but we just right now have a single value forecast. We demonstrated uh, last summer that we could do the calculation for the 2.7 million reaches of the continental United States in 10 minutes, the whole country. You know, this is one of these cases where, yes, high technology really is delivering a social benefit here. Uh, <coughs> what the National Weather Service is doing is they are taking that uh, structure and making it a little bit more sophisticated with different forecast horizons. So what you see here is four different forecast horizons that are hourly, three hourly time step daily, and a longer horizon out to 30 days ahead. And all of those forecasts are going to come out on the same NHD Plus uh, river channel system that you saw. So by May of 2016, internal to the National Water Centre, this national forecasting system will be operational, and then in F F FY17, which is about a year after that, they'll start putting out information um, out into the uh, public domain, but initially it'll just be within the weather service itself. So the current system is 6,600 basins and 3,600 forecast points. Uh, for the Blanco River at Wimberley, that's two forecast basins and one point, uh, and under the new system there will, there will be... 130 catchments and flow lines that get forecast upstream of Wimberley, including the Little Blanco uh, River. And of course we need the gauges and rainfall that you mentioned as well. So those two things can dovetail together to provide a uh, verification of what the forecasting system is. So what you see at the bottom is that under the new system, the average area of a drainage basin that contributes to flow was one square mile compared to 400 under the current system. So this new system will be 400 times more spatially uh, resolved. Uh, it's basically the atmosphere to the ocean, coast to coast, like a pipe network through the entire country. It's the first time that that's ever been done. One of the other things that's important is so-called linear referencing, and that means this is a system of river addressing. So Don showed the Rural Route 12 bridge that happens to be at location 70.246% upstream of the downstream location of that particular reach at Wimberley. So the, the idea of this is instead of saying, oh, I'm going to forecast at a point, you can forecast anywhere, in, you know, in any location along the lines here. So this is a con completely continuous system. It doesn't, there's no beginning and no end at all. Another thing that's an opportunity exists is for new measurement technologies. So a uh, USGS Streamflow Station costs $30,000. That radar that you see on the left there costs $3,000. And it pings the water service elevation. So you, know, with, you can get 10 of those for one USGS gauge. And if, we can, if we're calculating the flow and we're measuring the water level, we can do verification that way. And maybe we can be deploying uh, observations at much uh, more wide, widespread locations than the ones that we're contemplating now. Uh, the instrument on the right measures surface velocity with radar. So new measurement technologies, I think, can augment this forecasting system. We also need to be able to do uh, inundation mapping. So the National Weather Service now has maps at a few locations, and this is one of them, Onion Creek at Highway 183. And as the water level rises, the map um, spreads out, as you can see here. And so what we're planning to do is to work with the Texas Division of Emergency Management to be able to make these kinds of maps uh, everywhere for, uh, for our state, which is 102,000 reaches. Um, in addition to that, the National Weather Service itself is producing this thing called Situational Awareness for Everyone, or SAFE, and this is the Austin-San Antonio uh, Weather Forecast Office uh, area of jurisdiction, and they're building a web interface so that you can take these forecasts and maps and focus in on an area like the Blanco River and say, let me zero in here and say, what is a minor flood, what's a moderate flood, what's a major flood, what is the condition of the river uh, at my location? So let me uh, finish here and say that continental flood simulation works. Uh, it's an amazing thing, actually, and it's being implemented by May 2016 at the National Water Centre. Um, that UT Austin and the City of Austin are contributing through the experiment. We've had lots of interaction with the City of Austin. And uh, this new system will be 400 times more spatially dense, and it's going to be updated uh, hourly. Uh, as it comes online, and as I mentioned, there's going to be 130 forecast reaches in the Blanco River watershed above Wimberley. There'll be 110 in Onion Creek above Highway 183. And I think we need a much more densified observation network to support this system and not just have more flood forecasting. So that's my story, and I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Harry Evans, who was formerly with the Austin Fire Department. Uh, and Harry's been working with us on first response um, uh, Okay, and let me say that 
Harry and I uh, go to Gethsemane Lutheran Church in Austin, Texas, and so does Cal Streeter, who's the, the next speaker. So this is, a, this is a Gethsemane program, you could say. You know. <laughs> Your Lutheran Church is working for you. Yeah. <laughs> John Berry here is a member of our parish, so thank you for coming, John. <laughs> so uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Uh, there we go. So thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Uh, Dr. Maidman, I knew that he was a professor at UT from my church, but I didn't know what he did. And I think he knew I was a firefighter, but he didn't really know what I did. And then after the Onion Creek flood in 2013, and there were numerous articles in the, uh, in the, in the paper and in media about uh, the trials and tribulations of that particular flood. And he sent me an email. He said, I think I can help you. And I said, how can you help me? So I sent an email to our folks and said, do you know Dr. David Maidman? I know him from church, but I don't know what he does. And, he, and they said, oh, yeah, he's taught all of us hydrology. And uh, it's, it's an honor to work with a, a national worldwide expert. Um, let me go the other way. So my piece is, is, the, is the flood response planning. And to, to eat this elephant, we've broken it into four different components. There's two of those components to the action phase. And so that's the piece that the emergency responders are, are going to need real-time uh, forecast maps. It helps, it helps them and enhances their response. And there's the warning piece, the information that the public needs to know about this flood or about this particular disaster. And Dr. Streeter is going to talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, then there's a planning piece. And uh, Don's talked about that with some of the Wimberley, uh, w- w- with some of their experiences. The ability to, to look at, at minor, moderate, and major flood levels how that looks on the landscape, and plan your actions according to what those, those particular levels might be. And then the last piece is public education. So I'm going to talk about each one of these areas uh, just a little bit and kind of give you a flavor of what it is that we're working on from the public safety perspective. So why is it important? Real-time flood response, response maps allows you to be more accurate and precise with the allocation of your resources. We all know from... from years in in the business, that you can always find a disaster that will outstrip the resources of any community, whether you're the largest fire department in the world, FDNY, or whether you're Wimberley, Texas, with a small department. The disasters will outstrip your resources, so precise resource allocation is important, and, and then knowing or anticipating what you might need. The public warning piece is, is, is significant, and I can tell you from years in the business that a lot of times... And, and you receive those warnings probably over the, the Halloween floods we most recently had. You received that warning on your cell phone that said, there's flooding in your area, check local news. Is that you or not? And so, so we've got to have something that's credible and that's actionable. The pre-planning piece always enha- enhances disaster response. If I had the other football team's playbook and I knew what they were going to do, I could be much more effective. Same traffic with, with dealing with emergency response. That if we have... Uh, if we run through these drills and we understand what the threat and risk is for a particular area, it's going to enhance the response because you can anticipate what the, what the disaster is going to do, whether it's a wildfire or a flood, which are the two big area-wide disasters that we deal with uh, frequently. And then the last piece is public education. When the, public, when the public's informed and they understand what the threat is, it enhances the emergency response. The public's more resilient. And in fact, if the public is out of the way of the particular disaster, the emergency response community is, is, uh, is in a lot better position to help folks. Just like a wildfire, it's a wide area event. And if people get out of, out of the way of that disaster, then the problems get much easier because we're not using rescuers to make 100 swift water rescues. We might be able to use them in other areas. So those are the kinds of things that, that are real important when we talk about, about response. So what does that look like? So we built a prototype map book. This is a flood response map book, and it's a planning tool. And we looked at the, at the four largest offenders in, in Austin, Texas. So uh, the uh, Onion Creek, Shoal Creek, Walnut Creek, and um, Onion Creek, Shoal, Walnut, Williamson. and Williamson Creek, along the south part of the, the city. So... And what we did is we, we correlated those flood levels with the minor, moderate, and major flood levels uh, that the National Weather Service uses. And 
we created a prototype that would look like this, for instance. And this is what, what, the, uh, what the first responders are really looking for. You see a map of, of Williamson Creek here, and it shows what the water would look like at a major flood level. So that's a certain particular stage height in this, in this particular area. And you can see the, the streets. You can see where the houses are. You can see the, the, the colored dots on there indicate the depth of water. And so those mean a lot of things to the emergency responders. It shows the flow of the creek, so river right and river left. And in the public safety community, those are important. So to vet these, we've talked to fire departments all across, uh, all across Travis County, all across Williamson County, and even spent a day with Houston Fire Department uh, after their flood back on Memorial Day, talking with them about what are the tools that they would like to have to, to be more effective in flood response. Because all the science and all the, all the work that we do at, at this level, if it's not usable and useful to the end user, then some of our work's in vain. And so that's really what we try to do is connect with that, with that community and make sure that we're getting them the things that they need. So earlier I'd referenced wildfire. And after the 2011 wildfires, the, uh, the city of Austin created a, a ready, set, go for wildfires. Things that you can do as, a, as, a, as the public to make yourself more prepared for wildfires. And if one does strike, then things that you can do up to and including evacuation. So we're going to look at ways to provide that to the public and that public education piece that I talked about earlier, about giving them opportunities to, to learn and educate themselves about the things that they can do. And that there's sometimes, rather than evacuate, you might be better in your home. And it just depends. Remember, a lot of the folks that get killed in floods are people that are driving. So that's a real tough decision for emergency managers. And Don, I know you've had to make that decision. Do I evacuate people from their home, from a place of safety, put them in their cars, and now they're on the roads, and, and they may drive into, into, uh, into a particular flood. And so that's a very critical decision, and that decision needs to be made with some science and some effort. And then the public needs to understand that if we tell them that they, they need to protect in place and stay in their house because the water's only going to be three feet tall rather than driving on the roads, that's, that's a tough decision. But we have to have that information. So what does it look like in the end? In the end, there's three different things that, that we're, we're striving for. One is a flood response map book. And so what Chief Nim Kidd, the director of the Texas Division of Emergency Management, asked us, he said, as you're working on this, I want Engine 1 in any city in Texas, any town in Texas, any community in Texas, I want Engine 1 in any town in Texas to be able to use this. So it, it, it has to be... It has to be uh, uh, set up so that anybody can, can use it. So a flood response map book for first response community, the personal flood response guide so that the public is educated, and then all of it has to be web-based. And Dr. Street will talk some about communication, but, but you know that, that that's, how the, that's how the community is going to get their information is via their cell phone or computer. That's how the first response community gets their information. And so those are, those are the things that we're, we're striving for. And that concludes my presentation. Dr. Streeter? Thank you, Harry. You got one? Yeah. All right. Well, this is amazing, uh, amazing work that uh, Dr. Maidment and his team is doing, and, and Harry certainly brings a uh, uh, sort of practical element of what does this mean when you talk about public safety. My... Um, Let's see here. I didn't uh, get a rundown here, so um, just the down arrow. Okay. There we go. Um, so uh, when we met earlier, um, one of the things Harry said to me is it's, it would be useful to me to try to understand something about why people have the information that we send out, but they choose not to follow instructions. They, follow, they choose not to take action to protect themselves. And as you uh, can, can imagine, that's a very complex set of decisions that gets made. In fact, um, this is what I call the risk perception to action chain, warning to risk assessment to action. Uh, that's a very simple conceptualization of a very complex set of processes around information exchange, decision making, that occurs in um, what is inherently a system of uncertainty. Harry just talked about, you know, do we 
ask people to evacuate or do we tell them to stay where they are rather than to be out on the streets? And so there's a, a lot of uncertainty about that. And the work that Dr. Maidman is doing is, uh, is amazing in terms of its ability to sort of help forecast where those floods are going to be. Um, I, I put together this simple little uh, conceptualization simply to reinforce the idea that one of the primary goals of emergency management is to, once decisions have been made, get that information out to people in, the, in an accurate and consistent way so that people can make um, assessments about their level of risk and what would be appropriate actions for them. Um, and so the, one of the things that Harry asked is, well, what, is, what are the factors that really affect people's perceptions of risk and what to do about that? And there's been a lot of research done in the social and behavioral sciences about this particular issue. But if you distill it down, there's basically four broad categories of, of factors that have been looked at. Factors related to the risk itself, uh, factors related to the information, uh, the, the message and the dissemination of that message, personal attributes of the individual, the person receiving the message, and then uh, contextual factors that may impact how we interpret that information and use that. Uh, surprisingly, information about the characteristics of the risk don't seem to be very strongly associated with uh, people's perceptions of risk. You know, having some sense that we know how likely an event is or the magnitude of that event doesn't necessarily make people feel, understand what the level of risk is. Perhaps that's because we take those complex scientific calculations that Dr. Maidment was showing us a minute ago, and we distill those down into things like a 100-year flood, an F4 tornado, a Category 5 hurricane, and that the general public doesn't have any frame of reference for interpreting what that really means to them. Okay? Um, the second set of information, of, of factors relates to the information and the dissemination. And Harry was referring to that just a minute ago about the importance of timing. It's amazing the, the, the uh, system for sensing the flood potential uh, in the Wimberley floods over Memorial Day. You know, some old ranchers upstream calling down and saying, hey, we got a lot of water up here. You guys need to be thinking about taking some action. And to pull the trigger to evacuate people is really amazing. Um, so the credibility and the confidence that we have in that source of information is, is really important for how we um, interpret and make that decision. Timing is important. Uh, had the ranchers delayed 10 or 15 more minutes and you had waited another 30 minutes to make the decision, many more lives are likely to have been lost. Uh, message content. Message content has to be clear and concise and in, a, in an easily understandable way to the general public. As I said, talking about... 100-year floods and F4s and, and Category 5s doesn't make a lot of sense. But to make uh, that message clear and concise and in a format that the general public can understand um, and provide some practical guidance in terms of what actions should be taken. Personal attributes, a lot of things have been looked at in terms of personal attributes and how that impacts people's perception of risk. We've looked at age, we've looked at gender, we've looked at race and ethnicity, income level, education level. Uh, religiosity, how religious you are, whether or not you're a homeowner. And two things really emerged from that uh, area of research. One is the extent to which you've had previous experience with the disaster and the uh, level of trust that you have in authorities and experts. Now, experience with previous disasters could, could be either direct experience where you've actually lived through that experience or indirectly by hearing family and friends talk about that experience and what, what that was for them, or by listening to media accounts, or um, perhaps even doing volunteer work at a, at a shelter. Um, I grew up in Nebraska where we had tornadoes all the time. To be honest, it was very rare when I saw a tornado. In fact, I didn't experience tornadoes directly, but I heard friends and families talking about those experiences so many times that it really impacted me. When a warning happens, you began to think about taking shelter. Okay? Um, the relationship between previous experience and perception of risk is not as straightforward as we might think. Uh, for example, people who've survived a disaster without any serious personal loss often underestimate their risk for future disasters. Okay? They, um, they uh, often feel, I made it through this one and everything was okay, I'll be okay in future disasters. And that can be a dangerous assumption, especially if you think about the floods that we've had over the last few weeks 
where uh, people who have never been flooded before, all of a sudden their homes were flooded. And so just because you survived the previous disaster doesn't necessarily mean that you won't um, uh, experience that in the future. On the other hand, people who have experienced some kind of tra- traumatic, respo- uh, traumatic experience because of that um, disaster often become hypervigilant and overestimate their level of risk. Um, you know, we've heard stories of after the, after the floods of Memorial Day or the Onion Creek floods that for certain people who were tra- traumatically um, uh, affected by that, that just the mere emergence of a thunderstorm on the horizon causes them to begin loading things in the car, preparing to evacuate, looking for a place to go, even when the risk may be very minimal. So the relationship isn't as straightforward as we might think. The same with trusting in authorities and, and experts. The, um, uh, the fact that we have a great deal of faith in our authorities and experts sometimes helps us uh, to underestimate our own personal risk because we believe that the authorities and the experts are going to be able to take care of any situation that comes along. And it may minimize our own um, sense of responsibility for taking actions that we really should be taking to protect ourselves and not depending on um, public safety officials. Uh, Contextual factors, uh, again, a lot of things have been looked at. Um, um, uh, Economic factors like unemployment and... and, um, um, uh, Well, I forget what the other way to say. Um, but the two that sort of emerged out of all of that are cultural um, beliefs and um, uh, social networks and interpersonal decisions. Cultural beliefs can really shape the way we perceive the world around us and what we need to do about that. Uh, for example, um, we've resettled a lot of recent immigrants and refugees in the Austin area, and many of those people come from places where uh, they have a deep suspicion of government officials. And so that can affect their perception of trust of authorities. And so they may be reluctant to, to, um, to listen to authorities about uh, the impending disaster. On the other hand, there are other sort of culturally, deeply held cultural things like, you know, self-reliance and pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. I can't depend on anybody to do this for me. I have to take action myself. And those people are much more likely to... Uh, put together a personal evacuation plan, a personal d- disaster plan. You were talking about one of the things you're putting together is a plan for personal um, responsibility to take care of that. And so s- because of certain cultural belief systems, you're much more likely to do that. Um, others have a much more fatalistic attitude. Um, it, I can't do anything about it, and so I put it in the hands of God, and whatever happens will happen. Um, and so it's sometimes hard to reach people who have that sort of an orientation about how to take protective action. Uh, regarding social networks and interpersonal dynamics, we think of these decisions as being a personal decision. Uh, but the reality is that um, we often make those decisions in the context of our interpersonal relationships. And in fact, some of the research shows that one of the first things that people uh, in this connected world in which we live in, when they see a, a um, disaster warning, is they contact others in their personal network. What do you think? <laughs> trying to verify that information. And what they found is that if the others in their personal network say, you know, I don't think it's going to be as bad as they predict. I'm going to stick it out. That person is likely to do the same. On the other hand, if your personal network says, this sounds serious, we're taking steps to evacuate, we're taking steps to do something, that often um, uh, influences the decision as well. Uh, There's this thing called the risk perception paradox. I was talking with somebody uh, before the presentation about this, where people have this... have accurate information, and have an accurate assessment of what their risk is, but in fact don't take appropriate actions to protect themselves or their family or their property. And there are two or three things that sort of show up in the literature about why that is. One is that um, the, the benefits often are perceived to be greater than the negative impacts. I grew up in Nebraska um, in the Platte River Valley. Uh, and when I was a kid, it used to flood on a, almost a seasonal basis. Today, that's not so, uh, so much the case because they've built lots of lakes and dams and water um, control systems. But the farmers continued to live on the floodplains where there was that risk. Why? Because that's where the fertile soil was at. And so the benefits for them outweighed whatever the risk was of being in that place. Um, uh, individuals understand the risk, but they don't really know what actions to take. This group of people would be the ones who would be especially relevant for the public education. How do you reach those people? How do you t- to help them understand, here's the risk, and here's what you need to be doing to protect yourself and your property? Uh, some individuals know the risk, but they simply lack the resources to be able to act on that. Uh, after the hurricanes, we saw a number of communities across the country, that, around the Gulf Coast, that uh, required you to lift your house. 
high or above the floodplain. But for many people, that's completely out of the question, given the wherewithal to do that. They don't have the resources to do that. And so some kind of program that would help assist with that would be pretty important. Um, if you give an evacuation order, some people may lack transportation. Some people may simply lack the gas to put, the money to put gas in their car to evacuate if we're asking them to evacuate an area. Um, so what's the implications of all that for risk management? Well, given that um, trust in, in authorities and uh, direct experience are two of the most important predictors of risk assessment, it seems important to provide opportunities for the for the members of the community to be engaged somehow in that process. Uh, Public forums and community meetings can be a great way of sharing information uh, about potential risks in this community and and, uh, what our pre-planning activities should look like. Uh, The map that Harry showed where uh, along the river you could pinpoint the specific addresses, those are places that are at great risk. That may require going out and canvassing door to door to reach that population, particularly in some communities where that could be a hard to reach population. But that can be an expensive proposition. So how do you do that? Well, what would be wrong with organizing citizens from the community and training them to be local educators and promoters? In public health, there's a model called promotories. Uh, where they go out and do health assessments and teach people about diabetes and obesity and those kinds of things. And what they found is that people are much more receptive to messages that come from someone they consider to be a peer or an equal than they do from somebody who is considered to be an expert (laughs) or an authority. Um, And so there may be opportunities for us to to engage citizens from the community in that kind of process. Public forums could be a great way to disseminate information to the community, but I think it should also be seen as a great opportunity to collect information from the community. The communication has to be a two-way street between public safety officials and the community. Those people who have experienced that disaster, the people that you talk about in Wembley, I consider them to be lay experts, (laughs) and they can provide some really unique insights into that planning process and what needs to be done. I think it can also go a long way to building that trust that we saw is so important between authorities and and the community. And I think the last thing it can do is it can help clarify what we can expect from our authorities and what we have responsibility to do for ourselves. As I said, people who put a lot of faith in the authorities often say, I don't don't need to do anything, they've got it under control. When in fact, from um, a public safety perspective, yes, the authorities have the ability to do certain things, but we have a responsibility as citizens of the community to take steps to protect ourselves as well. And I think that's, okay, that's all I had to say. (laughs) Okay. Thanks, guys. Really interesting presentation. I have a question about this perception of risk ideas for these immediate risks. I wonder how much you feel it's uh, translatable the sort of longer-term risks, drought, which don't come right away, these sorts of things. Is, is there some of the same factor in um, um, Well, uh, the, 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 the perception of risk in an immediate disaster, uh, often we have pretty clear information about that, but droughts and well, I've, some of the work I've done has been in the area of earthquake preparedness uh, in the central part of the United States, and it's the same thing. And it's much harder to get people to sort of accept that risk, uh, understand that risk. When it's a long ways away, it's perceived to be a long ways away. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the work that we've done around earthquake preparedness, um, you know, people understand that a, that a major earthquake can be catastrophic, but it hasn't been during their lifetime experience. In fact, uh, for the central part of the United States, the last major earthquake along the New Madrid Fault Zone was in 1896 and 1897. Mm-hmm. And so to get people... Um, um, to really understand the, the, the potential risk of a major earthquake uh, is really sort of out of the realm of their experience, and so it's much more difficult, I think, than it is for those risks that are um, immediately upon us. Okay, thanks. Can I, can I jump in and add something, just as a, as a sidebar? In, in this mayor, may, I'm, I'm not the academic, <laughs> but, but I can tell you what, I've, I've been through three floods yeah. of significant proportion, two in New Braunfels, and the one in Wimberley, and, and I can tell you that I think there's a perception issue, there's a difference in perception issue rural versus more urban too. Mm-hmm. The problem we ran into, and I see a couple of our, a couple of our valued residents out there in the, in, in the audience 
that, that can attest to this. And if I hear one more person say the water is never going to get that high, <laughs> it's never gotten that high. And the historical perspective, which you don't hear as much in, in the urban environment, that's another thing that I think plays in. There's, there's, a, there's an environment, kind of like, for lack of a better phrase, an environmental impact too, I think, that, that comes into play. And, and that's the thing that I think we went up against with the people that didn't get out in our community was so many of them said it had never gotten there before. I'm not going to worry about that. Well, when the 70-year-old rancher calls me and tells me he has never seen it there before, you need to get out and you need to get going. I mean, we ran into this this, this past week. We got hit with our Halloween flood, which, by the way, is the second in two years in our community. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the concept of how somebody says, well, I've, I've had my property for 16 years, and I've never had to get out of my place before, so why are you telling me to get out? We'll ride it out. And then you go down and knock on their door once. You give them three reverse 911 calls to get out, and they fail to leave until the water's four and a half feet deep in their house, and then they call you and tell you to come get 17 people out of their house. And you have to go arrest them. And you got to go get them. You can't, you can't walk away from that. And you've got to do it with a smile on your face, but your lower lip, which is the hardest thing in the world to do, too. As, as Harry can attest, and I can attest to that as of last Friday, too. So that's my two cents. Yeah, the perception of risk is, is interesting. In 2003, we did a study about the, the wildfire threat in West, uh, western Travis County, and it really fell on deaf ears in 2003 because it rains 30 inches a year in Austin. In 2011, all that changed. And so I think that uh, uh, it, sometimes that risk is, is based on your, your personal experiences like Dr. Streeter said. Well, one of the things what we talked about with reference to the information was the timing of that. Mm -hmm. And part of it is, can we get information to people in a timely manner so they can take actions? But part of it is also related to pre-planning and preparedness activities where I think folks in Central Texas now are much more willing to hear the message mm -hmm. as it relates to floods today than they were a year ago at this time. And so part of it is the timing of uh, these events happening and now people being primed for that message. And so I think we're in a unique opportunity where we may be able to begin doing some additional planning and, and public education because there's a more receptivity to that information. Um, that was a really great uh, talk there. I was wondering, um, uh, the fire department has a, uh, Harry, uh, Mr. Evans, you talked about a nice brochure where they can look at what these high-risk areas are and how the, uh, the waters come up and what levels they are. and That directs them where to put their resources and where to go. If I think about the homeowners or the residents, um, it, you think about information that could be uh, perhaps property-specific or very location-specific and then what type of message to get them. Uh, in some cases, it seems that the... Um, the warning that goes out is region uh, may be specific, but not individual property specific. And so it's hard for the individual to interpret that. And so both from a technical point of view and also from a communication point of view, I'm wondering um, uh, how far are we from being able to put out uh, a message to an individual that maybe is tailored for them that says you have a 90% chance that your property is going to be inundated by three feet of water. Uh, and so it's very specific. So, I don't know. The, communication, the communications network is there right now. The information mm -hmm. is getting there as a result of some of the stuff David and, and others are working on. But the communications network's there through reverse 911 and, 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 and those type of things and, and other sources of uh, media as they come in. But we literally have the ability through our reverse 911 systems to go in and pick out parcels or pick out streets and, and those type of things. Uh, Educating them to the awareness of that message, you know, in, in the in '98 in New Braunfels after that flood, which was 175,000 cubic feet per second, a huge flood. Uh, GBRA came in and, and, and initiated a, an alert system uh, and, and went through a massive education effort to try to get people up and down the Guadalupe River to understand when they sent out a notice that said it was a green event or it was a yellow event or it was a red event, they could draw a correlation as to exactly what Harry's talking about doing. Harry's idea is much better than theirs, not critical of theirs, but his is more down to earth. You have to communicate at their level. And if you tell somebody a 90% chance, you need to tell them. That's one of the things that's been fascinating to me in this, in this, in this post-Memorial Day event is I know FEMA of old, and the FEMA I knew is not the FEMA of old. 
And I have had more information given to us through this event that is real information, that is usable information. When you tell somebody and they put out a map that says, here's the, here's the new 100-year floodplain for your community, and where it's yellow, the water's going to be four to six feet deep. Where it's this, it's going to be six to eight feet deep. That type of data has never been available to us before and to homeowners in the, in the redevelopment process. So we're moving in that direction, and the same from an not emergency notification standpoint. Well, and they're, and they're moving away from that notion <clears throat> of 100-year flood uh, because people have the perception we had that in March, or we had that in Memorial Day, we're, we're, we're good for the next 100 years, when the reality what that means is there's about a 1% about a one chance of that occurring at any, at any given year. Um, and so that means there could be a, a, a flood like that this year, there could be another one next year, there could be another one next year, but this notion of a 100-year flood sends the message that we're good, we got that covered, we had ours in, in, in Memorial Day. What you're saying is so true. We, we stood, and, and the Balthazar, I mean, you, you went to the community meetings, and there wasn't a community meeting we, we had after that event that we'd not tell people, it is going to happen again. And their comment is, oh, we won't be around when it happens again. We won't live. It's 100 years. And our comment is it could happen tomorrow. And so last Friday happened, you know, and I, and I drive down, and there's a business guy out there who's in the process of putting his business together on the other side of the creek who we won't name. And he, he play, I pull up, and I roll down my window, and I said, hey. He said, weren't you the one that? And I said, well, and he goes, you're right. And it's going to happen again. You're so true. Such a misnotion of, of the 100 year. I mean, it could happen today, it could happen tomorrow, it could happen six months from now, and, and that's why you've got to dummy the message down and get real with the message to the people and help them understand it. We don't talk about any 100 year floodplain stuff in, in all of our, our flood stuff. To answer your question, the maps that we're working on with the, the area fire departments and Austin, those are all prototypical. So they're still in development stages. When we get them refined to the point where everybody can use them, I expect at some point in the future there may be something for that as for the public as well. Cool. Don't anything to do with floodplains or anything that that sort of thing. That's that's a regulatory issue. We're only talking about minor, moderate, and major flood levels. So yeah, at the end of the day, I think the public should get that information and deserves that information. We just need to make sure that we get the right product. Hi, um, my name is Letha Allen. I'm a, a student at the Community and Regional Planning Program here at UT, and we're doing a Hill Country studio. So I was, we're inter I'm interested from the point of view of the built environment. Um, if, if there's anything that can be done to mitigate these kind of things in the future, um, I've seen some videos about um, doing different things with uh, plantings along the riverbeds and things like that. But also, I was wondering. How many of the homeowners or business owners have um, flood insurance? And if they don't, what are they, are they rebuilding or how are they funding that? Um, in, in our community, uh, and I don't think we're alone. And Harry, you, you might be able to testify more from Austin's perspective, but very few of our victims had flood insurance. Many of those victims were repeat offenders, which means they had had several occurrences. And, and that the house I saw that blew up, the three-story million-dollar house had been through three or four flood events, and they just made the repairs and moved on. Uh, I don't think many are going to do that now. The, when you get federal assistance now with FEMA, you're obligated to have insurance. You have to maintain insurance at that stage of the game. Uh, so I think you're going to see more folks insured uh, because more of our community sought assistance and sought federal aid. Uh, Development is, is development regulation is huge. Uh, looking at uh, impervious cover requirements, uh, looking at cluster developments as opposed to the standard subdivision developments, to the point which you can mitigate and you can you can deal with green space and you can you can deal with erosion control and detention ponds and things like that. Thinking outside the box. Uh, in addition to elevation, uh, do not fear elevation. And that's the message we tell people. If you live on the river, if you live at the Gulf Coast, that's part of life. You need to prepare for the storm. And part of the preparation for the storm is elevating your home properly to the point that it can deal with flood flows more effectively. Uh, you know, interesting note, and, and I think you said this, the education level plays a huge factor in the decision-making process, and, and I'm blessed to manage a community that, quite frankly, has some extremely well-educated people. Uh, that's not to say New Braunfels, Texas, did 
it, it had many educated people, but in 98, in dealing with the post-flood redevelopment in 98, when we talked to people about coming in and having to elevate their homes and doing that voluntarily and thinking through that process, we didn't have as many takers as in Wimberley in this situation, even those that did not have to go up are in talking to us about going up. And Wimberley has a, a pretty high education level. Translation, the people are smarter, they're understanding, they're, 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 they're trying to plan ahead, they're trying to think forward. New Braunfels at that stage of the game in 98 was not there. And, and, and I think it's probably a different mindset in New Braunfels now having gone through 98 and those type of things. But past experience uh, and education level play a huge decision in helping people safeguard, I think. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think communities can do a lot in the way of development regulation. Um, can they? Yeah, they can. Can they legally? They actually can legally, and and you know, it's it's you, you've got you've got to be careful in the development of the regulations to the point that you don't take someone out of the use of their property, and and that's very important that you that you keep that in mind. But there are ways to go through and develop in floodplains that's safe that helps minimize. And, and not just in floodplains, but keep in mind, a lot of these flood flows get generated by development in communities, and the water eventually gets to the streams. And so it's important that you don't just look when you're talking about flood management. You don't just look on the streams. Yeah, you've got some mandatory requirements along those lines, but you think about the development in the inner city, if you will, where a lot of that runoff's being developed, too, that's going in. So there are ways to do it, and communities are doing that. We're going to be revisiting our development regulations, um, you know, and, and, and deal with those type of things. But... Example being, uh, counties don't have a lot of the development and the regulations that we, we have as cities. And until counties get the regulatory authority that cities have, there's always going to be a challenge. A lot of the flows that we took came from a rural environment that was a county environment. You know, and, and so they don't have a lot of the authorities that we have in our development requirements. So. There are ways to address it, and, and it just takes planning, it takes thinking, it takes recognition. Events like this go a long way towards riding the ship, unfortunately. Hi, my name is Virginia Lurson. I'm a doctoral student in the School of Information, um, and my area of research is disaster response and recovery. And I had a, a question regarding, um, kind of related to this community engagement issue, um, so in 2013, of course, with Onion Creek, there wasn't a lot of any advanced warning, and there was a lot of stories in the press about how people were, you know, warning each other, warning their neighbors in that process that happened. And in Wimberley, of course, you had a very short turnaround time. Um, and so I'm, I'm just curious if, if uh, Mr. Ferguson, if maybe you could share a little bit of how did people inform each other? Like, I imagine, with, say, with tourists, maybe the reverse 911 call doesn't, go through if Wimberley's a tourist community. So did you find examples of how people informed each other about the impending disaster or how to get help? Yeah. Um, big issue. Um, in our community, we're a tourist-based economy, and we have probably 75 to 100 bed and breakfasts that exist in our community. And if you're staying in somebody else's house and the phone rings, not many of us are going to pick the phone up because they're not going to know if that call is really for me or not. So that was a challenge that we encountered. Uh, we are going back and revisiting our regulations when we issue our permits for those type of establishments to require them to have landlines and to require those lines to be registered at least to the point, and also their cell phones, to be registered to the point that they can get that notification through our system or through the county's 911 system. Uh, word of mouth was huge. Uh, my story which is a story I don't like to recall, uh, was one that uh, I found myself pinned uh, down at the very end of a road, pulling people out of houses and could not get back out. Uh, they didn't move when they got the call because the water had never gotten there before. Uh, but when you go and knock, and Harry can tell many, many stories, along and the stories, the things I saw that night, I'm not going to get into. But what I can tell you is it's not a joke when you get the phone call and you better take the word serious. And, and we found in our community, we've had some criticism from some who got phone calls on the county's reverse 911 system because they felt like maybe the direction was not stern enough. But I, 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 don't, <laughs> I don't know how when you call somebody and you say, evacuate your residence, what else can you say other than getting into a language that we don't want to get into on a telephone? 
Uh, and, and so, you know, you're, you're up against some of that human nature. You're up against some of that history. Uh, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, it is a challenge in a tourist community to communicate with people. Social media, I, social media scares the hell out of me, to be honest with you. And I, I'm, I'm a Facebook virgin, as my son would say, and, and email is new to me. But I mean, I'm there with email. But I, we, the, the disaster after the disaster in our community came with what Facebook did to us, uh, and, and the amount of misinformation that went out. And the same thing in the middle of it. So I'm, I'm leery of saying we need to implement something through social media because there is so much out there in the world of social media that, that does more harm than good in true, open, factual communications. So we've got to be careful on that end. But uh, we have kind of taken a position. Uh, we have a citywide network, the citywide communications phone system that we use. We have the reverse 911 that we use. We use neighborhood. We have property owner contacts that we try to activate going POAs. In our situation, we, we issued all those warnings. We had part of our community that did not move. And they were, they were dead straight in the site. And so we went down and one of us took one end of the street and the other one took the other end of the street. And I managed part of my disaster out of a pickup truck, you know, stuck in two and a half feet of water watching it rise, uh, you know, while I saw the world pass in front of me. But we managed it and, and got through it. But, um, uh, you know, it is a challenge, and in the insurer space community, it's a big challenge. I mean, my community population goes from 2,600 people to almost 10,000 people on a market day's holiday weekend. And I mean, and those are people, I can tell you, when we started blocking off streets two hours before the floodwater hit our community, I had people driving up going, well, I need to get down to my place. And our comment was, you can't get down to your place. You need to go to the community center. And they said, well, well, how do we get back down to our place? And we said, you're not getting back down to your place. You need to go to the community center. Here's where you go and, 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 and think ahead. So communication is huge. Consistency in the message is huge. Uh, make sure your firefighters are saying the same thing you're saying. <laughs> you know, make sure your phone calls are saying the same thing all of us are saying on the streets. You know, uh, and, and, and trying to anticipate um, reaction is very important, too. Uh, so you can try to head off problems down the road. <clears throat> we, we had a meeting in, uh, in San Marcos talking about the re reaction to the floods, and one of the things that was interesting, uh, one of the uh, emergency response people said, people looked at their computers until the water was actually lapping around their feet. Wow. Yeah. So actually people do depend a lot on their computer to try to inform themselves about what the environment is that they're facing. And just to follow on, what we found after found out after wildfires was that a lot of people don't have landlines. Mm -hmm. And so across the United States, that's the case. So as scary as social media is, I can tell you from, from running the 11th largest fire department in the United States, Austin, Texas, <laughs> that we have to leverage that. We have to find a way to leverage that and contact people so their cell phone goes off when they're in a flood risk zone. Not when they're 10 miles away from it, but when they're in that zone. Don't know what the answer is, but it's a very relevant question, and it's one that we're going to we're going to drill on for a while. If but it's if it's coming from the government site, which in the AFD's case or our our emergency management, we created a system called Haze Informed that we utilize. But the problem you run into is those who spin off that, and I don't know how you manage that. I just have to yeah, something we'll have to learn. Um, you guys mentioned that there was uh, some resources coming online in 2016. Uh, until that comes to be the case, uh, what are the main resources or websites that people can go to, event planners or people that are looking at these things and trying to get a pre-warning? What are those things that we can go to now? In our, in our community in Hayes County, we have a website that we set up called Hayes Inform. And of course, we, we enhance our phone networks with cell phones as well as landlines. We've set our requirements, you know, weather service, uh, I think is doing some things maybe a little bit more differently. You probably got a few more warnings with the uh, Halloween flood than you got in the May flood. Uh, I think they've stepped up some of that oversight and some of that warning. Uh, you know, that's another thing. If I can jump in real quick and just add something. Harry hit it on the head, and, and they were talking about, you know, getting the thing saying, you know, look to your local TV. You know, how many times that phone went off. And at some point, it's the same, I, I, I consider, that we've got to be careful in our warning system 
to a degree because at some point you're going to target hardened people. It's kind of like the same things of how many times you drive through a neighborhood that says slow children at play. And you see that sign every day and eventually you become target hardened to it to the point where it doesn't have the meaning it does the first time. I bet my phone went off in the middle of dealing with what we were dealing with in, Hall in the Halloween floods. I bet it went off 10 times, 15 times in the course of a couple of hours. I mean, it was... We were getting Hayes County warnings. We were getting, you know, they were sending us Kamau County warnings. We were getting Travis County warnings. And it was just bam, bam, bam. And, uh, you know, you got to be careful. And, I don't, again, that, those are things that we have to work through and figure out how to manage it, and we will at some point. Uh, but uh, until those systems are in place, you know, I, I think Travis County has a very good road closure site. Um, their fire department has a very good Twitter page. Uh, We've got our, our websites. We have our networks and phones. That's about all we can do right now. Hopefully, you'll have some river data that the Weather Service can start using um, as early as January. Uh, the, the rainfall gauges, which are probably as critical, if not more critical, than the stream gauges for the Weather Service, as they tell us, are still probably six or seven months off because uh, that's a network, and they're having to build a radio tower for that. 